I've got some hot takes from around social media to put to you. I'm going to give you the hot take. You only give me what you think about it. You can respond to what we hear. Okay, let's get started. Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez will combine for 50 plus goal contributions this season. Right now between them, it's 34 with Messi on 19 and Suarez on 15. So we're saying 50 plus goal contributions combined this season. Uh, they'll, they'll hit that be, uh, before half halfway season. Right, he, so you... he, I, I almost want to say easy. I mean, the 50, you know, I remember a lot, you know, last season you gave me, uh, you know, you gave me Holland with 40 plus and I didn't believe you. I mean, that was tough. I thought that was tougher to achieve than, than what you're asking me right now. I mean, they're, you know, you look at the last game and those two on the same page, they look for each other exclusively when they feel like it almost. So uh, it, it's their world and we're living in it. And I think they'll hit 50 in, in next uh, seven games or something like that. When it's all said and done, it's probably be around 70. We've got a fun question here. It goes back to something from when Messi first came to MLS. It says, Messi and Suarez impact a mockery of MLS. Well, it seems that way. I, You know, I mean, th there's good and bad in it, right? I mean, it's almost it's almost too easy. I watch that in awe and I appreciate what uh, Leon, Lionel Messi does because, I mean, it's, it, it's almost, you know, there's like, 10 times during a game when he decides I'm going to do it now and he does whatever he wants. So, I mean, that's wonderful to watch. Uh, I think, we, you know, he's done that by the way in Europe, but now, now it, I, it's just incredible. I mean, you know, what can you say? They are. So that's a positive for major league soccer because we're talking about it constantly. We see highlights of it uh, just about everywhere because people appreciate the brilliance, not just of Lionel Messi, uh, but even uh, Luis Suarez. But, the flip side of that, it's 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 almost too easy. But then again, that's major league soccer. Defensively, it's lacking tremendously, and they're exposing that every which way. Okay, your next hot take. We're heading back to the Premier League. Chelsea are better situated for future success than Manchester United. By a country mile, because I mean, there's so much. The the the. They're earlier to the process, aren't they, right? I mean, I've said it here, talking about Manchester United and Chelsea season. It's been disappointing and, and similar in so many ways, right? But the one big difference is that uh, there are a lot of young players that are coming good. Okay, pressure is off, so that's a little bit easier. We'll see if that continues for the rest of the season. And obviously, we're going to judge Chelsea uh, differently uh, next season as well because our expectations are going to be higher. I think we're going to want to see Chelsea from the beginning to show that at the very least they can uh, – uh, they can contend for the top four uh, after spending so much money. We all know that they're going to have to divest uh, uh, a lot of key players. I suspect that they may uh, uh, transfer in some others, but uh, I mean, there's zero comparison. I mean, the, because the clear clear out, if you will, has taken place with Chelsea in the last couple of seasons. And, and uh, right now, the, the a lot of the young players, you look at Cole Palmer, you look at Madueke, you look at Jackson, you look at uh, Mal Gusto, hasn't been playing as of late, but, you know, but yes, she'll, everybody's kind of just uh, uh, finding their feet just a little bit. So you'd expect if you talk to, about process, very much like we had Ar with Arsenal, a lot of young players three, four years ago when Mikel Arteta started that, it's paying dividends right now. And I think with Chelsea, they can at least feel uh, that the worst is over. The, the worst is still ahead of Manchester United. Quite frankly, I don't know how they fix it. OK, so tell me this, Janish, even though there are likely to be changes ahead at Manchester United, if you were a manager now and you had the choice to go and manage at Chelsea in their current situation or Manchester United in theirs, who would you choose and why? I think I've just explained that. First. I mean, I don't know where I would go with Manchester United. Uh, I really don't because, uh, you know, we talk about the clear on Manchester United. Some of it is realistic. Some of it, it, it isn't. Uh, I mean... How many players, I mean, we're talking about three or four players where I feel comfortable can make a difference and you can build around. The rest is waste. It's simply waste. And, and in, you know, in the years past, uh, before, you know, everything, you know, the, the, the finances in the Premier League, I think it would have been a little bit easier. Uh, right now, I think the pull of Manchester United is still there, but it's less and less with every season. And I think, although 
I would never give up on Manchester United in terms of them coming back to their glory because I think it's one of those institutions that managers and players alike will still take a chance if they see that uh, you know the years of management uh, mismanagement that are coming to roost right now are on the way up, and I think there's there's at least they're trying to do something about it right now that you feel that maybe off the pitch things are getting better but before i mean look it's probably three or four seasons before we can actually even think about manchester united challenging for the title okay well at least we're nicely to a fun question that's coming here which says at what point are we going to say it's not the manager and it's been the players and then in brackets since sir alex it's been a problem yeah, I mean, at any point you can say that, as I just mentioned. I mean, th these are years of mismanagement, so it's players. But, um, you know, I think with every manager, uh, you know, if, if I look at Ten Hag, I mean, part of me feels for him. But when you come to Manchester United, and Jose Mourinho has done it, everybody has done it, even though maybe there are some promises made, I mean, these guys know how this works, that the, the, the promises that are made are very often – just that, promises. And at the end of the day, you have to, as the CEO of the company, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, Ten Hag or any manager, you have to find a way. And and it's been super hard for them. I get that because you look at that team against Crystal Palace. I mean, look, even if Bruno Fernandes was available uh, in that game, and maybe even Rashford, I thought that Manchester United were going to lose. But, you know, to have that sort of a midfield and Casemiro at centre back and all the issues that even a little kid understands where there are simply no legs to deal uh, with the pressing and youthfulness of Crystal Palace. Uh, you know, yeah, of course, it's not just on Ten Hag. That's, that's easy. Next hot take. Jaden Sancho should play for Manchester United next season. Well, he may be forced to it, but if I were him, I'd do everything to stay where where he is. Uh, you know, he seems to like that environment. I, I suppose everything's going to depend on on um, if Eric Ten Hag's going to be there. If Eric Ten Hag's going to be there, then he doesn't want Sancho, and certainly Sancho doesn't want to be part of that. So uh, there's going to be have to be a conclusion. He may stay at Borussia Dortmund or goes go goes elsewhere. But I think if you Sancho right now, I can't imagine that he's even thinking about uh, going back to Manchester United. And if he's asked that question, I'm sure he's dreading it. Next hot take. PSG beating Real Madrid in a Champions League final would be the perfect send-off for Mbappe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for him, right? For of him course. personally. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Of course, of course it would be. Uh, I... I don't see it, but I think for him, uh, you know, I don't know how play, you know, when you go into a club, obviously you're going to be a professional, you're going to win it. And, you know, people will eventually forget it. I think for him, the important part would be to leave PSG on his terms because that club is very near his heart. Yeah, it's easy to say there's a lot of money, but we all know that, you know, this is his town. He grew up on the outskirts of, of Paris. And, and of course, we know how much he means to the to the PSG supporters and, and, and vice versa. So it would be special. I would love to see it because it would be a story in itself. All right. Uh, last one. It's a name you've mentioned actually today already. So let me put it to you once again. Cole Palmer should be the Premier's play, uh, Premier League's player of the season. I uh, No, but I, I do have to admit, because our, our producer, Rob, I don't know if you remember, Kay, and it was not even on the air. He was telling me that he should be starting for England, and I, I shut him down. That was a couple of months, uh, months ago. Uh, I tell you what, uh, Rob knows his stuff uh, for sure, and, and maybe I didn't give him – not that I didn't give him benefit of doubt, but I, I just didn't think it was going to be – he's going to play this sort of a role this quickly – and he's been absolutely sensational. Uh, but I'd still, if you go sort of like for like, if you will, uh, I wouldn't. I'd give it to, to Odegaard uh, if I had to choose right now. Uh, easy decision for me. Obviously, Palmer is very, very young, and, and that may change for me. I, I'd even give it to Saka before I give it to him. So, no, 